All right, so good afternoon, everyone, um, and welcome to the RAL seminar. Um, and so we have some folks uh, here in person, and also uh, thank you, welcome to those of you who are viewing online as well. Um, so just a few housekeeping details. Um, if you have uh, if you have questions, please you know, raise your hand if you're in the room afterward, and I'll bring the mic over to you. Um, or um, if you're online, please submit your questions by a Slido. Uh, just down below the um, below the, the the webcam where you can see uh, see this talk, you should see a link for the Slido there, where you can enter questions, and I'll I'll moderate those. Uh, and also, if you are interested in either giving a RAL seminar or yourself, or um, if you know someone, say a visitor who's coming in, uh, who would like to give one, uh, please reach out to me, Jared Lee, and um, I can help get you on the schedule. So our speaker today is Dr. Maria Frediani. Um, Dr. Maria Frediani is a project scientist in RAL, and her work focuses on numerical weather prediction, encompassing primarily the disciplines of cloud microphysics and fire behavior. Dr. Frediani has 15 years of experience with the weather research and forecasting, or WARF model, including model development, forecast plus processing, deterministic and ensemble verification, and uncertainty characterization. She obtained her BS and MS in meteorology from the University of Sao Paulo, Brazil, and PhD in civil engineering from the University of Connecticut. Maria first came to RAL as an ASP graduate student in 2014 and joined our staff in 2018. Since then, she has served in the RAL Representative Council, the RAL DEI Committee, and is one of the FACE's founding members. In 2021, she received the RAL Award for Advancing Diversity, and in 2022, she received the UCAR Outstanding Accomplishment Award for her contribution to diversity. Currently, she's implementing a cloud seeding parameterization into the model for prediction across scales, or MPAS. She's part of the team implementing a fire behavior component for the Unified Forecast System, UFS, and has recently completed the firebrand spotting parameterization development for the WARF model, which she is presenting today. Maria? Thank you, Jared. That was a very kind introduction. I wonder who wrote that. <laughs> <laughs> um, hi, everybody. Thank you for coming in person, and thank you for everyone attending online. Uh, this is very exciting to be here. I'm very happy to be here. So uh, thank you for sharing this moment with me. Um, I'm here today to talk about modeling firebrand spotting in WARF fire, specifically targeting coupled fire weather prediction. The work that I am presenting today was funded by the RAL Opportunity Fund to implement ignitions on the firebrand spotting parameterization. Uh, I'll talk about that, and then I will demonstrate the, its application by simulating the Marshall Fire in Colorado. Uh, so let's start with what is it and why model it. Uh, firebrands are embers, uh, also known as embers. They are burning pieces of materials, vegetation, uh, building materials that are generated at the fire source and they are carried with the wind and convection. When they land on unburned fuel, uh, they can ignite new fire spots. And so this is important because uh, in high wind speed driven fires, uh, when that is combined with a low relative humidity and flammable fuels, that often leads to uh, very high fire intensity, rapid fire growth, uh, and ember showers that can ignite new spot fires. Um, so when we have these uh, intense spotting events, that affects the fire behavior predictability, uh, that can accelerate the fire rate of spread, and the fire will be able to jump over barriers, which increases the dangers to fire crews and challenge the emergency response. But then ultimately, uh, these fire simulation capabilities, they are an important component for forecasting local and regional weather. As we all know that fires affect the vertical convection, they interfere with cloud formation and precipitation, and they generally interfere with the local weather. Um, so here, this is actually starting from the end. These are my results, um, but I think they 
uh, they show here the actual importance of modeling firebrands and spotting. The animation um, you're seeing there was generated with a vapor and the credit goes to Scott Pierce for helping me uh, with that. But here, uh, what, I'm, what I wanna show you is, um, so if I use the mouse, it kind of freezes there, or is it just for me? Oh no, it kind of freezes a little bit. Uh, but so here at the top, you see a control simulation of the martial fire with no spotting ignitions. And here at the bottom, you see a simulation, one of the simulations with uh, ignited fire spots. And you can see how different they are. And that's because uh, the martial fire was a wind-driven fire. And in this case, and as, as in so many other cases, spotting was a uh, dominant fire spread mechanism. Uh, so when we don't have fire spotting represented in the fire behavior simulations, the predicted um, fire area will be underestimated. And these containment barriers that we have here, which are the Marshall Road and Highway 36, they, uh, they delay or deter the, the fire spread. So it is really important to have spotting uh, represented in these simulations. So the context for this work, um, I started the development um, of this parameterization back in 2019 as part of the Colorado Fire Prediction System project. Uh, back then, I implemented a Lagrangian transport, but spotting ignitions were not part of it. And then later, now, with uh, the Raul Opportunity Fund and in collaboration with the University of Nevada, Reno, through the Leap High project, I am able to actually uh, do that last bit of this work. Um, last bit, it's kind of a relative thing here because if you've all done a parameterization, you know it never ends. But so like here, this is the, the first version that is fully complete. And I have just submitted a publication to James um, which is also available as a preprint on a tinyurl.com slash frediani2024, if you're interested. Um, so before I start about uh, talking about the, 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 the modeling and the implementation itself, I want to just give you a brief uh, overview of fire behavior models and spotting. Uh, that's because the approach to modeling spotting actually depends on the fire behavior model that it, uh, it, it goes with. So uh, I categorized them in three major categories. So on one end here, you have the, the computational fluid dynamic models. They are semi-explicit semi in resolving combustion and chemical processes. They resolve the heat transfer and examples of these models are the FireTech and WFTS. They are expensive computationally. They run over very small domains. Then on the other end of the spectrum, we have the fast computation applications. And they use parameterizations to represent these uh, combustion processes. Uh, for example, the Rothermel and, or the Balbi parameterization, which are kind of similar. And then there are also models that use an approach called the cellular automata. Um, so the Rothermel and the Balbi parameterizations, they are uh, empirically derived, whereas cellular automata is a raster-based approach to propagate the fire. So uh, the fire is then considered to be a stochastic process, and it propagates to adjacent cells um, based on the probability of that fire propagating. And so then the probability is calculated through a probability of uh, topography, weather, and fuel. Uh, so these models run really fast. Um, and that's uh, Farsight, Behave Plus, and Quick Fire, for example. Then in the middle, you have the atmospheric models, uh, which use a semi-empirical fire behavior, similar to those uh, fast computation models. But then the atmospheric models have the capability of, uh, uh, of actually interacting uh, uh, with the fire, so the atmosphere actually responds to the fire, and you're able to run those models on, a, a, on an actual regional domain. Uh, and that's the case of Worth Fire, also Worth as Fire, and uh, two other models that I am not very familiar with, which is the ARPS, Dev Fire, and Afore Fire. 
Um, so then uh, for the more expensive, computationally expensive models, you have a spotting capability that, uh, that follows the same principle that is, is, is very highly resolved and includes uh, particles of perhaps multiple shapes, not just spherical particles, and account for, uh, for various um, processes that makes these uh, models very expensive. Then on the other end, the spotting for the fast computational models, they are empirical formulations. They are typically calculating the maximum spotting distance and the spotting probability. Uh, so that's very simplistic. And then so now finally we have something for the WORF model, which is the firebrand spotting parameterization in WORF fire. And that's uh, what I'm gonna be presenting here today. So first, uh, thanks Cindy for putting together the nice uh, figure here, which illustrates uh, the, the processes for the um, uh, WORF fire, firebrand spotting parameterization. Um, that uses a Lagrangian particle transport framework which means that the model follows the particle rather than uh, monitoring the grid points, which is what typically done in WERF. Um, once a fire is ignited in the model, um, you, the, the firebrand schemes, scheme generates firebrands along the fire front. So they are released uh, in the atmosphere and they are transported with the wind, with the atmospheric flow. They may burn out, they may land, on a surface with no fuel, um, or they also may ignite a new fire. So these are the specific parameterization components here. So, um, so for the generation, you have firebrands being released into the atmosphere um, from the grid points along the, the fire front. They are released over multiple levels um, and these firebrands are spherical particles. So once they are released, uh, the transport, um, the advection follows the model's atmospheric flow. At the same time that they are advected, they burn out, which means that the particle properties change. So we have changes in mass, density, and temperature, and those changes also affect the particle terminal velocity. So then at some point, these particles are either going to burn out completely and disappear, or they're gonna land. They land once they descend below a user-specified threshold. And if they land on a grid point where fuel is available and the ignition criteria is met, then uh, those firebrands will ignite new fires. Um, and so here is uh, the implemented ignition criteria and that relies on two user set thresholds. Number one is the number of neighbors. And so here, if you have, you see the grid and uh, we're looking at this uh, X cell here, which is our IJ. And so the number of neighbors can be as low as one, which is that central cell itself. And uh, that cell can also have eight adjacent neighbors, meaning that the number of neighbors in this case would be nine, and so that number can go from one to nine. And then in addition to that, you have the total number of firebrands landing on those cells, which is uh, the, the block of cells corresponding to these uh, nine ones here. So in this example, we have the red one where we had uh, three firebrands landing, and on the orange ones, we had two firebrands landing, and on the yellow ones, we had one. So the total here would be nine. Um, if the user has set the criteria to five neighbors and nine uh, total firebrands, then that cell would ignite a new fire. This is actually a good point for questions related to any of that, if anybody has anything. Or I can... Is Slido going, only going to be available afterwards? No, Slido should be available uh, anytime, but I don't think I don't think there are any questions yet. Okay. So. I have one question, Maria. Con concerning the the neighbors, so you just take the most likely igniting neighbors. I mean, so all, you have all those neighbors you can choose from. 
you just specify the, they will specify a threshold of, let's say, five neighbors, and then the ones that are the most likely probability. It's going to be the center cell. So so each I, I go through each one of the cells, and so that specific central cell needs X number of neighbors and a total of Y number of firebrands, and then it ignites at that cell, at the exact location, um, the center of the cell, yeah. Okay, but... It's not symmetric in your example, right? So that was based on the numbers that were falling or based on the wind speed? Is the wind speed the connection or is that... You know, There's just a random example. Just random example. Yeah. Because, yeah, I don't... It can be at any pattern, right? Okay. All right. Thanks. Yeah, just Thanks, Mary. So just very quick following up. Uh, is it so? For this case, it's a three times three boxes. So it can also be four times four, or five times five. Or does it depends on your grid spacing? I'm trying to think of like you falling of a, a firebrand, not necessarily in the three times three boxes, right? Are you talking about the generation points here or here? On the right, yes. Uh, what do you mean three times three boxes? So you are selecting the neighbor's maximum number equals to nine, so it's a three times three boxes. Could it be four times four? Or it's just the adjacent neighbors, just like the connect directly to that cell. Um, so on the neighbors, do you also have the land use at this part to know what material it is or if it's ignitable or if it's... Yes, so it only counts if there's fuel available. It doesn't necessarily... Uh, currently, there's nothing to check the amount of fuels, but it needs to... It has to have any fuel load above, above zero. And it cannot be a cell that has already burned. So if the amount of fuel is not included... How these are different fire brands? Like the, the magnitude is different. Like in the, in the example. Well, in the example, we had fuels. <laughs> so, um, uh, so then it's not going to count at all. No, I meant like the. You have different gradings, one to three. Just a random number of fire brands that would have landed here at this central point. Um, but that's assuming that all of these grid boxes are valid landing boxes in terms of fuel. And also not, th not taking account of how much fuel is there. Correct. And we have a couple of questions online. So Rajesh asks, are the ember particles assumed to be of the same size at the time of emission, or do they follow a predefined size distribution? That is a great question, Rajesh. So right now, it is a user, we have a default configuration for them to be uh, the same properties that can, so these properties can change if the user wants to change them, but they are all uniform. So that's one thing that's definitely a, a point for improvement in the future is to create a dis distribution with those properties. And then a question from Jeremy Sauer. What determines the number of levels over which brands are generated? Are the levels constrained to those containing some type of surface or canopy fuels? Uh, that's also a very great question. So right now it's a user-defined uh, number of levels. Uh, and then Laura Sundberg asks, just to clarify, is particle transport, transport based solely on advection by local flow and a terminal velocity? Uh, yeah, yeah, pretty much. So we we fetch the properties from the atmosphere core of the model, U, V, and W. Uh, we have a burnout, so we have the particle temperature, and so uh, uh, that is also included in, in, the, in the calculation. But the advection part is just uh, that, yeah, it's the, just from the model. Sounds good. All right. So moving on. Um, so uh, then to demonstrate this implementation, I'm going to go through a simulation of the Marshall Fire. 
which is actually the case study that emphasized the need for this ignition automation in the first place. Um, so the Marshall Fire started in the Boulder area in the late December 2021 at approximately 11 a.m. local time. It reached the residential area in about one hour. Uh, so currently right now we have two official documents, uh, which is the Marshall Fire Investigative Summary and the Boulder County Operational After Action Report. Um, and both of them indicate that obviously because they are created somehow in the sequence, um, they indicated that the fire ignited from two distinct sources. One was a downed a utility line and another one was a shed on fire um, very close uh, to each other. Um, one thing that I thought was very interesting from those documents was that assessment that that was a particularly wet and warm spring, which allowed the, the grasses to grow taller and thicker. But then from June to December, that actually was the warmest and driest year on record, which led to the favorable fuels for that fire to spread. Um, the actual fire spread was driven by a downslope windstorm with records of wind gusts going up to 100 miles per hour. The relative humidity was around 20% and the fuels conditions were, uh, were the ideal fuels condition for that fire to, to start. For the model configuration, um, we have a nested uh, domain with the um, child domain run in LES mode. Uh, the parent domain was configured with a grid interval of one kilometer, whereas the inner child was a grid interval of 111 meters. We also have a grid refinement for the fire behavior specifically, which was set to a refinement of four, meaning that the fire behavior uh, ran at, a, uh, at an interval of 30 meters. Um, then the initial and boundary conditions uh, were from her, uh, every three hourly uh, intervals. I have here a list of the parameterizations I used for that simulation. The fuels were the Anderson 13 fire fuels and the ignition was a 100 meter ignition line placed at the approximate ignition location here indicated by the star. The firebrand spotting parameterization was configured with a generation interval um, at every other time step. So uh, a generation was set to two, meaning that at every other model time step, a new generation occurred. Um, the particles were distributed over 10 vertical levels, um, evenly distributed up to, I think it was 50 meters here. The land height was set to three meters, which is approximately the height of the infrastructure in the area. And then for the ignition sensitivities, I, I configured 12 different um, uh, combinations here. And um, so with, I indicate with the letter T, the, the total number of fire brands and N, the number of neighbors. So for example, here in the first one, we have a, a total threshold of five fire brands and just one neighbor, which means just the central cell. Uh, the second one is five fire brands at least and two adjacent cells. This is important because um, specifically in the case of the Marshall Fire, when we have these barriers, um, we cannot really go up to a very high number of neighbors because you have the, the barriers which have no fuel and, and, and that goes back to uh, Chishima's question. So here's an example of what that piece of grid would look like. You have the fire spreading, so the, these, all these points are, uh, have an active fire, but then we have this barrier here. And so for the fire to spread across this barrier, um, in this situation here, we only have one, two, three, four neighbors and the actual cell. So uh, in this case, the ignition would only happen if we had set the number of neighbors to five. And so that's why you see here that uh, my experiments, they end with the number of neighbor of six because that was um, 
kind of like the upper limit for the simulation. After that, it didn't make much a difference. And then this is a very interesting part, which I actually had fun doing, way more fun than I, than I hoped. And um, uh, you, 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 I think you, you will agree with me. Um, so verifying these cases is a challenge. Uh, there is not a lot of data, and not all of cases have data. Uh, we know that amber showers happen. They were mentioned in the official documents, and we have uh, lots of social media records, uh, but they, we don't have any measurement of firebrands. So the approach here would be to measure the fire area um, and to verify the fire area. So then the first thing is to use the official fire perimeter. Uh, in this case, the timestamp of this perimeter was four days later after, the f after we knew the fire was uh, controlled. Uh, however, there's a lot of information in these official records to indicate that there was not a substantial uh, fire spread uh, after that night. So the most substantial amount of, um, uh, the, the most substantial fire propagation happened during the day. And so here I'm making an assumption that this perimeter is not substantially different from the perimeter we have that night of that fire. And then number two was, was the part that I thought it was uh, fun and, and it turned out to be, uh, I think, great, um, was that I actually used some of these social media um, records. Um, Nine News compiled a pretty interesting page that they called the, the marshallfiremap.com. They compiled uh, the social media records and so they georeferenced those records and they put a timestamp on them, and so you can go through each one of them and the accompanying um, text that wherever it was published. Um, so a lot of these are uh, videos from from police patrols, so they are not at a specific location. So I definitely excluded those, but some of them you see like it's it's a specific address. Uh, you can find exactly like what is the street or the intersection where they were filming. And so I selected a few of those um, from, from this uh, nine news compilation and also from the operational after action report. They also cited some, some, some timestamps there. Um, and so then I got to eight point observations. I eliminated some that were redundant, like very close to one another. It didn't make sense to, to include both. Um, but so then I, uh, this is an example of the table that came out of it. So I, here I have three examples. So I have the approximate uh, coordinates from the report, the reported time, and then I specify the location just to refer to these locations by a name, uh, which I think are, can be clearer than just a number sometimes the source of information. But then I had to make some adjustments. Number one was, um, let's start here, with the corresponding model output time. I associated that record with a corresponding model output. Uh, the models, uh, the outputs were, were done every 15 minutes. So for example, in this case here that we have 1246, I adjusted the time to 1245, the nearest model uh, output time. And then if you look at this map here, uh, you will see that we have the dark gray, which indicates no fuel, and we have a lot of points with no fuel. The original coordinates were those red dots here, um, and a lot of these red dots fell on a no fuel grid point. Uh, I actually did the whole verification like that first, but then I have 12 different configurations, but then none of them reached the, the location of the observation. So that makes it really hard for me to distinguish one from the other, like which ones are better or not. So then I came back to this and I adjusted these points a little bit. I moved them uh, towards east, which is where the source uh, was located, over a point where, uh, where fuel was available. And so they are um, significantly close to the original location and they corresponded to kind of uh, different um, areas of that observed fire perimeter. So um, 
I think in this case, because it's a small case, it worked out pretty well, and it was feasible to go through all of these observations and, and, and readjust the location. And so then with that information available, I used the following verification measures. So number one was the arrival time, where, um, where I checked the time where um, the fire area at a specific group point became greater than zero for each one of the observation locations. Then another one was based on the contingency table, uh, which is just a typically um, when you have a positive forecast and that uh, agrees with a positive observation, then you have a hit. Uh, similarly, you would have false alarms and misses. I'm not really looking at correct negatives here. And then lastly, I'm looking at the Heidke skill score uh, because that is actually the same score typically used in fire uh, behavior verification known as the Cohen's uh, Kappa. And, um, and so then I, I chose to use this metric, which is also derived from the contingency table. So it's kind of convenient to, to, to just calculate it. Um, the score uh, is one for perfect forecasts, and it's zero to forecasts that are equal to chance. So um, here in this figure, um, I'm just showing the, the, the difference between the control simulation and one of the uh, spot ignition simulations in terms of the arrival time at Highway 36. Um, you see here at the top you have the, the, the simulation name, control, and T92. Below you have the model output time in UTC, and then here in parentheses in local time. Um, uh, another thing to notice are the points with no fuel here. Uh, they help you identify the Highway 36 here and Marshall Road here. Um, the simulation without spot ignitions is just going to show a white fire area, whereas the simulation with spot ignition is going to show the fire area and the purple points on top. Each one of these, uh, these points indicates one fire ignition, one valid ignition. So you see that at this point here, you have pretty much an entire fire area was ignited by uh, spot fires. Um, so here, then the arrival time for the control simulation was at 9 p.m. Um, and you see that um, the fire just um, went along uh, south of Marshall Road and probably uh, it was uh, significantly deterred by the, by the road mesh here, and it arrived pretty late at Highway 36. Whereas when we uh, use the, 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 the spotting capability, the time of arrival is 12 p.m., which is roughly uh, around the time that we, uh, we saw the, the fire arriving at the, at the highway. Um, so that's an example showing that spotting actually played a fundamental role in the fire spread of this fire. Um, and we have a, here a difference of uh, nine hours between uh, the arrival time in these two scenarios here. So then next, when we look at the arrival time at the observation locations, what I'm showing here, the control is going to be on the top and then the fire spots T5 and 2 here at the bottom, so total of five firebrands and uh, two adjacent cells. Um, so uh, these two model outputs are at 2 p.m. local time. You see, it's very small on my screen, but you see here uh, South Boulder Road and Home Depot and Superior, they all have a, a timestamp at 12.45, you have hillside at 1.30, and this model output is at 2 p.m., and you can see that the fire area from a control simulation barely left the ignition point, whereas uh, when we have spotting, we already have the fire uh, jumped across Highway 36, and it's, it's pretty close to these observation locations. And then next, we have a snapshot at 5 p.m. 
And we have here, we, oh, I have my glasses. And then here we have um, Harper Road at 4.30 and uh, McCaslin and Colton. And we have Troon Court at 4 p.m. Again, uh, the control simulation is propagating very slow, whereas the fire spotting simulation, you have a, a fire area that is way more realistic um, if, you, if you compare it with the observed fire perimeter. Uh, you can see here as the control is advancing that it is contained by Marshall Road substantially. Um, yeah, and that's probably one of the causes why, why it's, it's, it's so slow. And then finally, we have here at, at the model outputs at 8 p.m. Uh, with one observation at Vista Lane at 7.15. Um, and yeah, and you see this is the, in this simulation here with spotting, the spotting didn't reach that location, but it, it, it got really close. It also didn't reach this uh, other location here, which is uh, Thrum Court. But I think that if decision makers were using, were basing their decisions off of the output of this simulation, this would have uh, led to an evacuation uh, um, alert here for, for this area, which might not have been the case with, with control. And so then to quantify the arrival time, we're going to look at some plots here. Um, so here on the left, you see for each one of the locations, you see the variability across the all of the simulations in terms of the uh, arrival time. Here we are looking at the absolute difference. Uh, the majority of the cases, the arrival time was later than the observed. We had a couple of them that was like one hour earlier, but I didn't think that distinction was um, significant here in this case. Um, but you see that uh, even Superior, which is the location closer to the um, ignition point, we have a lot of variability. We have some simulations that reach that point um, within less than one hour to up to two hours. But then we also have some simulations that uh, take six or over six hours to get to that location. Um, oops, sorry. They vary a lot, but then to um, to help me interpret that, I actually calculated the the median um, arrival time, and that's what I show here in this plot. Um, you will see each one of the configurations here at the bottom. Then you will see the median arrival time. The black line indicates the standard deviation, and the number at the bottom indicates the number of observation locations that was reached by that simulation. So you will see that the simulations where spotting is more favorable, meaning with like the lowest threshold, you see they, they get to more locations, like six, and then it starts decreasing. Um, and their arrival time is also, is also lower. Uh, so this is kind of expected. You, you, you decrease the threshold for when spotting needs to happen, and then the simulations, um, the fire simulation propagates faster. Um, and then next, uh, this is the result for the spatial verification. And um, over here, we are looking at all of the grid points in the model and comparing with the, with the official fire perimeter. Um, so here is starting on the left, the, the different colors, the bars in, at different colors show the heat frequency. And I put a, the, the cheat sheet here for the contingency table uh, next to it. Um, then the, this trestled pattern here um, is the uh, miss frequency, and then the points are the false alarm. So then what you're seeing here is that um, the highest re heat frequencies are the ones with the uh, more favorable um, spotting uh, configurations. We also have a higher, um, a lower miss frequency on those simulations. And, but at the same time, conversely, we have also a higher 
um, frequency of false alarm, meaning that those um, there was more overprediction from these simulations, meaning that we had a, a, a more mismatch between the observed fire perimeters and the fire perimeters in this simulation. And so another way to look at that is uh, to look at the high skill score, which then we can we can um, we can look at how they evolve through time. So here are just the time indices for the simulation, and it goes into eight or nine p.m., which is a number forty here. Um, so you see that um, at the beginning you have the the blue, the orange, and the green runs, they are typically the ones with the highest score, meaning that uh, these are the simulations with the best match between the, the simulated fire spread and the observed fire perimeter. But then at some point here at around uh, T27, um, then you, they are not the, the, the most accurate prediction, prediction anymore, and that's um, that is beginning to indicate that the fire area is actually becoming larger than the fire perimeter. Um, and then at some point you actually see that the score for these orange, blue, and green, it actually decreases with increasing time because that fire area is becoming significantly larger than, uh, than the, the observations. Um, so to me, that means that we definitely need a mechanism to modulate how, how the ignitions are happening. At the same time, that this is very challenging because we 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 don't really know. Uh, studies show that it's a function of the mass and the fuels, but we don't have much information about that relationship. And then if you think about everything that comes before that in, in, in how the process occurs. You, first you have the generation, uh, and we don't really understand a lot about how that generation happens. We know it depends on, uh, uh, on, on species, on uh, the amount of moisture in those fuels, and what we have in terms of observations are the firebrands that landed but not how many firebrands were released, unless those firebrands were released in the lab. Uh, so it's, it is a, a sequence of processes that are all in itself very difficult to model. Um, but so, but it, yeah, even though I think I think the results is 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 really meaningful here in that it shows that we we need to do more for this and we need to be able to incorporate this into the model. Um, so yeah, and then just to conclude, um, this implementation provides a more realistic representation of the fire physics uh, because it allows uh, the model to accelerate the fire rate of spread and allows the fire to jump across barriers. Um, I was able to use videos from social media to complement the verification here, which I think was really meaningful. Um, and I don't know, perhaps as we advance with machine learning algorithms, we're going to be able to compile that information more effectively in the near future. So I think that's, um, you know, I'm optimistic. And if you have time, you can also just go through them. Um, <laughs> um, and then, so I think like my most important takeaways were, uh, are that uh, all the 12 fire spot simulations, they outperformed the control, which I, I hoped, and it's good to see that this is what actually happened. Um, for me, these results indicate that spotting played a fundamental role in this rapid fire spread. And in this case, I think it was very interesting that uh, we, we noticed in the fuel, um, fuels map that the urban structures were represented by uh, by points with no fuel, which is not realistic. But in this case, even though we had many of those fuels, I think this was not the primary limitation um, 
to obtaining a more accurate simulation. This was really a matter of having uh, the model having the ability to spot. Um, and then the caveats of this um, implementation at the current state um, is that there are a lot of user-defined parameters, as I have been asked already. Um, that, is, that is a difficult challenge, um, but I don't know if it, that's very different from many other parameterizations that we have in the model. It's, it starts from somewhere relatively simple and then we advance as we more, learn more. Um, yeah, so the fact that there are so many user-defined parameters limits its, its broader applicability. Uh, and related to that, uh, one future step that I think it's, uh, it's really important and critical is to make it more uh, easier to use and, and more robust at some point. There is more about that in my preprint, if you're interested. It's in uh, tinyurl.com slash frediani2024. Thank you very much. Thanks, Maria. Um, so, yeah, so questions in the room. Uh, we'll start here in the room and then go online. Very interesting, Maria. Um, so you did these 12 cases with different numbers of firebrands and neighbors, and when you're looking at them, um, you know, I guess, what did you learn? The T5 seemed to do well in general, which is kind of a intermediate number, and then the neighbors, one, two, three. What does that tell you about the physics? Um. So, so when I looked at those results, I was actually expecting the, the lower thresholds to overestimate significantly because they were like low thresholds. There we have, in general, when firebrands are landing on a grid point, we have many, we're releasing a ton of them at the same time. Um, but that was not the case. And so it was like, wow, this, this fire spread was really impressive. And I believe that one of the reasons why this very low threshold fitted really well by providing a, a good model simulation was that uh, it is realistic. This is this is how aggressive that fire was. Um, yeah, I believe that to modulate that internally, we will need some function and probably correlate that with the wind speed in a way that the wind speed can actually turn on and off the spotting capability. Because right now you need to turn it on, like intentionally. All right, I'll take uh, Chris's question online and then go to you, Jason. Uh, so Chris Rosoff asks a general question. How far can a firebrand travel and remain aflame in the horizontal distance in both a model or in the documented observations? More particularly, in an extreme mountainous windstorm, how far downstream of a strong wildfire is at any risk of experiencing spot fires? So in terms of observations, we have a study in Australia. They actually had uh, some measurement equipment that I don't remember exactly what, but they measured up to 35 kilometers of spotting. Um, and then we, obviously that's an outlier that is not gonna be the typical one, but, that, but then you have the categories of short range spotting, which they really accelerate the fire propagation. Then we have like medium and long range spotting, which are really dangerous catch uh, um, operational firefighters um, not prepared. Uh, we know that the firebrands that travel the farthest are the firebrands with complex shapes, which is not the case in this uh, implementation. We have spherical particles. They burn out very quickly. Um, so here in this, I have not, I actually, it's a few hundred meters that currently in this model, uh, that's how far the firebrands have been traveling from the simulations that I checked is a few, just a few hundred meters. It's, it's not a lot, um, but it is, yeah, it is significant and it, it is sufficient to, to jump the highway and it is sufficient to accelerate the fire rate of spread for now. But we definitely need um, 
more sophisticated uh, burnout uh, formulations. And we do have a lot of those complex shapes in, 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 in Graupel research. Uh, they have done a lot uh, for modeling Graupel with more complex shapes. So perhaps we can fetch something from, from them and employ here. Uh, about the fourth bullet here, and and the fact that it turns out that maybe I mean, your conclusion is that the that the rather poor representation of of how burnable an urban area is wasn't the chief limitation you found. You may have already done this and just not shown it, but you could um, you could run a an additional experiment where you turn off the the spot fires and just make everything sort of moderately flammable and see if you get a, a result that remember, re resembles any one of your experiments with the spot fires or whether it looks like an outlier or you know, just to see kind of how realistic that is. Yeah, that, yeah that's interesting, Jason. Thank you. All right, I'll go online and go back to Shima. So Jeremy asks another question. What is the horizontal resolution of the local flow U, V, and W determining firebrand transport through the Lagrangian approach. How often are vecting velocities updated? So that follows the, the configuration of the atmospheric component in the model. I have them set to 111 meters. Um, it interpolates, it's a bilinear interpolation that uh, that finds the, the, the velocities and all the variables at the specific firebrand location but it's currently just, uh, just determined by, by the atmospheric model itself. How often are advecting velocities updated? I think I have a time step of three seconds for this simulation. Thank you so much, Maria. Um, this is an excellent job. So I had one question related to what Sue mentioned, uh, and that's, does that mean that by having a six neighbor versus two, it's mean that if any of the six member have a favorable condition, then the center will uh, ignite? Or, or am I missing something here that how, how to interpret that result? Um, and the other question is, so this was a very high wind uh, fire scenario. Do we know what threshold of wind makes it a more reasonable um, metric that we need to have a spotting for fire simulation. And if this is like below that, we don't need to go for that much computational power. I Yeah, so I'm going to start with the last question. Um, that number exists. I don't know it from the top of my head. But there are studies that uh, just indicate a threshold. Um, the challenge there is that it also impacts the generation, not just uh, the ignition threshold. And so the ignition threshold is actually going to be somehow related to how many firebrands are being generated at any given point. Um, so, yeah, that, that needs to go together somehow. Uh, your first question. So the favorable conditions need to exist at the center point. So we're, I'm looping over each IJ. And so at each IJ, I look at the surroundings. I, I exclude the non-valid grid points. And then I have a, a number. And then I have a total number of firebrands that landed and the number of neighbors over which those firebrands landed. Does that clarify? I think so. So you mean if the center burns, all of the neighbor, all of the adjacent members that are flammable will burn. That's that's the difference between. The oh, okay. So no, then it goes to the next cell, and then the next cell also needs to meet meet the criteria. So it's not all of the nine uh, grid points inside the block that will ignite. It's just the central. For more grid points inside that block to ignite each one of them needs to m meet the criteria. Let me 
kind of to your last point, Maria, and what you've been saying, it, it, my limited understanding is it seems like there's so many aspects of this that are inherently probabilistic. And I appreciate just the, the fire spreading is probably very computationally ex expensive, but I could see how you could generate so many different ensembles, if you will, out of this by allowing some kind of a randomness quality right. to it to really capture that whole you know, probability of where that, and also in a, in a sort of a data assimilation mode, you could also, you know, as you get observations, you could go back and update in almost a Bayesian fashion these parameters, if mm -hmm. you will, can find your PDFs as you move forward and could really sort of let it naturally evolve because you know each fire is going to be so uniquely different and and whatnot. Yeah, I'm curious what your thoughts are about that. Yeah, I think I think for this because it's a highly nonlinear process, I think that's the way to go. Uh, yeah, this is this is not something you want to do deterministically, um, but yeah, I, I think that that could be one way to. Uh, go around the fact that sometimes we only have a fire perimeter, so we would choose the configuration that leads to the best um, fire area match, and yeah. I'm curious too on the predictability um, aspect, how expensive this is to run an LES scale that you're at. You know, is this feasible for any kind of real-time forecasting? I'm guessing not. And so my question is leading into, is there a role for Fast Eddy for this in the future? Like, if we have that LAS capability and we don't necessarily need the mic... I mean, I'm going to say we don't need the microphysics probably for this so much, as long as we get the atmosphere right. It's not what I normally would say, but I'm, you know, curious. <laughs> is there a role for that, that this could be coupled with Fast Eddy for it to be more of a predictability tool in real time forecasting? I th yeah, I think so. Well, that, that's a question to Jeremy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so in terms of the uh, computational expense, uh, one thing that I was so surprised recently is that the most expensive part is the LES, assuming that you don't have uh, resource limitation. So uh, I, I was just doing some fire simulations on the ratio and I was maximizing the number of processors that I could use with that specific domain, right? Which means that I, I need a tile of 10 by 10 and then uh, it, and then as many processors as, as exists. Um, when I turned on and off the fire simulation, it didn't affect even an entire minute over a 24 hour period. So the real expense here, if you don't have the computational limitation, then it's going to be the LES. But I think most of the time, people just cannot afford to run this on the ratio operationally. It's just not available. And so then uh, it might be a little bit more expensive. But regardless, I think, yeah, there is room for, for Fast Eddy to do something here for sure. I think I have uh, one more question. We're almost to the end uh, of question time. But um, so considering the reports that have come out saying, um, you know, that there were two ignition points separated by about 45 minutes in time, have you run any sample simulation? I understand the reports probably came out after most of your modeling. Yeah. But have you since then done any model runs to, to use those two ignition points and the differentiated time to see how that might change the even the say the control simulation? No, I have not tried that. Um, I suspect it will change a little bit the control simulation, but the fire is just propagates very slowly there. Uh, there is a lot of sensitivity as well related to the model version, and I'm not entirely sure why that happens. But I I've done these simulations in WORF. 4.3, if I'm not mistaken, which was like when the all this work started for the Marshall Fire as well. And the fire spread is very different. And it's the same model configuration, just a different model version. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'm not entirely sure why that is, but I would expect that we will have differences. And that's why an ensemble is, is really important. Uh, so I think I'll probably make this the last question um, well, first of all, you know, Lulin says, great talk. I have many ideas to discuss with you offline. 
Um, Jerry Sauer says, definitely might definitely need microphysics for pyro CB. Yes, fast fire, please. And then um, he also says, interesting talk and work. Thank you. Certainly spotting is a critical component of real world wildfire and wooey fire. Does the firebrand parameterization permit tracking brand origin, burnout rates, and transport paths? Um, sort of. It's going to be a lot more expensive to track those uh, because then you, you, you need a lot of I.O., uh, but it's possible if you, if you set up a sort of a small, quick simulation, you can, you can track those. Burnout rates, yeah, because you can you can see the the mass and the sizes how they change with each time step, yeah. So let's all thank Maria once again. Thank you. And thanks to all of you who joined, both in person and online. Thank you very much. I should do this more often.